Welcome to Lecture 1C, the second lecture for Week 1 of Applied Immunology. We'll expand upon the last lecture by introducing two main categories of immune responses. Number one is innate immunity, and number two is adaptive immunity. For each arm of the immune system, today you'll be introduced to some of the major types of innate and adaptive immune cells, as well as their primary functions and how they relate to the generation of a successful response against an immunological insult, such as infection. Again, this lecture is intended as a general introduction, so please keep in mind that we will be learning about these cells and signaling pathways much more extensively in future lectures. In order to compare and contrast certain aspects of innate versus adaptive immunity, I find it helpful to consider these systems as they relate to three phases of an immune response. Infection and inflammation in blue on the left, where pathogens are detected, immune cells become activated, and effector mechanisms are engaged. There's a resolution phase in purple in the middle, this is where anti-inflammatory signaling is engaged to promote a return to cellular and organismal homeostasis. And then immune memory on, in green on the right, where long-lived memory cells are maintained to prevent future reinfection. Looking at the x-axis, you can see that these phases are separated temporally or over the course of time, while the y-axis serves as a generic measure of the magnitude of each type of response. First, during the infection phase with a pathogen, for our model here I'm using a virus in red, as a pathogen replicates, it first triggers a rapid inflammatory response mediated by innate immunity, depicted by the gray line in this figure. The cells and pathways of innate immunity are activated in response to broad classes of pathogens. In this example, these responses would be specific signaling modules that are engaged by most types of infection by any of a number of different species of virus. Innate immunity rapidly employs several mechanisms that are aimed at restricting pathogen replication while simultaneously stimulating um, pathogen-specific adaptive immune responses. So it's worth noting that for most microorganisms that successfully infect humans, innate immunity is often insufficient for pathogen control and clearance. So innate immunity, while triggered immediately following infection, typically requires the initiation of an adaptive immune response in order to successfully eliminate infection. Now, in contrast to innate immunity, adaptive immunity is kinetically characterized by a slower initial response to an individual's first infection with a given pathogen, and this is represented by the black line here. However, although there is this kinetic delay, once adaptive immunity is engaged, this provides a powerful primary response that is highly specific to that individual pathogen. Again, this adaptive immune response is usually required for successful pathogen clearance. Once the pathogen is eliminated, the immune system next engages anti-inflammatory signaling mechanisms that promote the resolution of inflammation as the response transitions to the purple section of the diagram. Here the host has successfully eliminated any remaining viral burden, and innate immunity is no longer activated. However, it's worth noting that the adaptive immune response maintains a pool of memory immune cells that persist long-term following the resolution of infection and inflammation. This formation of long-lived memory cells is, is an important hallmark of a successful adaptive immune response, which brings us to the immune memory phase of the diagram over here in green on the right. In this phase, re-exposure with the same pathogen leads to the same type of immediate innate immune response that we observed during initial infection, shown in gray. However, the kinetics of adaptive immunity are quite different now that the individual is equipped with immunological memory that recognizes this specific pathogen. The memory cells of adaptive immunity undergo rapid reactivation upon re-exposure to the same pathogen, which occurs more quickly compared to the adaptive response during initial infection. This also occurs to a greater magnitude compared to the primary adaptive immune response. Adaptive immunity therefore restricts pathogen growth and clears the infection, usually before any sort of clinical symptoms arise. And these types of memory responses represent the basis of immune protection that's conferred by treatments such as vaccines, which we discussed in the previous lecture. In the next few slides, we'll start to introduce some more detailed information about the specific cell types and functions that are involved in mediating the effects of innate and adaptive immune responses. But I want you to keep this schematic in mind as we start to learn more about how innate and adaptive immunity differ with respect to their timing relative to infection, their level of specificity for a given microorganism, and their contributions towards the formation of protective immunological memory. First, let's examine innate immunity, which I want you to associate with immediate defenses that are raised against broad classes of pathogens. I've designed some note slides comparing innate immunity to adaptive immunity across a handful of key parameters, the first being the timing of the response. 
Again, innate immunity enables the rapid detection of signatures of infection. This includes conserved molecular motifs found in pathogen-associated molecules, as well as damage-associated molecules that can be released by infected host cells. The rapid detection and effector mechanisms of the innate immune response allow the host organism to contain infection by restricting pathogen replication, which holds the infection at bay until the adaptive immune system is activated. Next, let's examine the specificity of innate immunity. As mentioned previously, innate immune responses are mounted against broad classes of pathogens, and this is enabled through pattern recognition receptors, or PRRs, that recognize pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs. PRR activation induces stereotyped responses against molecular motifs that are shared amongst classes of pathogens, for example, RNA viruses, although that group encompasses many individual types of viruses. A key point that I want to make regarding innate immune specificity is that pattern recognition receptors must only recognize molecules that could be introduced by foreign infectious agents, and that these receptors must remain ignorant or non-reactive to self-molecules. Again, this brings up the concept of immune tolerance, which will be a recurring theme in this course. Genetics and evolution are another important aspect that differentiates innate immunity from adaptive immunity. The receptors and execution or molecules of innate immune responses are typically germline encoded and are not subject to any sort of genetic rearrangement, which means that their repertoire remains fixed over the course of an individual's lifetime. These receptors and signaling components are also highly conserved amongst most animal lineages, as pattern recognition receptor homologs can be found from species ranging from plants to corals to worms to vertebrate mammals. So we can think of innate immunity as a more evolutionarily ancient form of host defense against infection. Lastly, I've listed some of the primary functions or objectives of a successful innate immune response, which enables the control of pathogen replication. First, cells must detect pathogens, which, as mentioned above, is accomplished through PRRs and other types of molecular sensors. They then must employ rapid effector mechanisms, which include the ability to consume and kill pathogens through the process of phagocytosis, which we were introduced to by Ilya Mechnikov's theory of, theory of cellular immunity, as well as the ability to secrete cytotoxic effectors that kill pathogens. The innate immune system is also often required for the stimulation of adaptive immune responses by presenting antigens to stimulate adaptive immunity. An antigen, which I'll abbreviate by AG, is simply a piece of protein taken from a broken down pathogen that is used to direct adaptive immune cytotoxic and memory responses that target that specific pathogen. Lastly, many innate immune cells produce inflammatory molecules called cytokines and chemokines, which are essential for fine tuning the different types of immune responses that are mounted against infection. To understand how innate immune responses are mediated or carried out, we need to learn more about the specific cells that execute innate immune functions. We'll start with this figure from the textbook, which outlines the differentiation of various immune cells here on the left. I'll refer to this differentiation diagram a fair amount in our first few lectures, so let's just walk through it briefly. All immune cells, which we also call leukocytes, are derived from a pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell population, which is found in the bone marrow. These stem cells give rise to two lineages of leukocytes, the common lymphoid progenitor, which yields T, B, and NK cells, and the common myeloid progenitor, which yields several different types of myeloid cells that comprise key cell types of the innate immune system, including monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, neutrophils, and others. As a quick side note, NK cells are actually derived from the lymphoid lineage, but due to their effector functions are often categorized as a type of innate immune cell, despite the fact that they are technically not myeloid cells. I know that there are several innate immune cell types listed here, so let's begin by categorizing them according to how they relate to the different functions or objectives of the innate immune response. Objective number one is to detect foreign pathogens and to distinguish them from self molecules. We know that this is accomplished through pattern recognition receptors, which are most highly expressed by macrophages. This is a phagocytic type of myeloid cell, as well as dendritic cells, which are commonly abbreviated as DCs. Objective number two is to consume pathogens or other harmful molecules, and this is primarily performed by professional phagocytes called macrophages and neutrophils, which for neutrophils, you may sometimes see them abbreviated as PMNs, which stands for polymorphonuclear leukocytes. Notably, DCs will also phagocytose debris, but this is typically done in the context of antigen presentation, which we'll discuss shortly. So DCs don't really eat up massive amounts of extracellular debris the way that macrophages and neutrophils do. 
Next, objective number three is to secrete toxic products that kill pathogens. Numerous innate immune cells produce cytotoxic effector molecules, which can be released either extracellularly or intracellularly into specialized organelles called phagolysosomes that are used by uh, professional phagocytes. So NK cells, neutrophils, and macrophages all generate and release cytotoxic molecules, as well as mast cells, eosinophils, and basophils, which we really haven't heard that much about yet. Objective number four is to present antigens from pathogens to stimulate certain types of adaptive immune cells. Again, an antigen is just a piece of protein that's been derived from a pathogen. This function is carried out by professional antigen presenting cells, or APCs. And dendritic cells are often viewed as the most effective type of APC, but macrophages can also present antigen from phagocytose pathogens. Lastly, objective number five of the innate immune response is the production of molecules called cytokines and chemokines which are generally secreted by most leukocytes once they become activated. These factors can also be secreted by non-immune cell types. Cytokines can have profound effects on the activation status of neighboring adaptive or innate immune cells, while chemokines are involved in the recruitment and migration of immune cells throughout the body. We'll learn a lot more about each of these functions of the innate immune system and how they interface with adaptive immunity in our upcoming lectures. Next, let's get into adaptive immunity, which I want you to associate with long-term immune memory that is mounted against specific pathogens. Let's go over a summary of the properties of the adaptive immune system like we first did with the innate immune system. First, the kinetics of the adaptive response. So in comparison to innate immunity, adaptive immune cells exhibit a slower initial response to infection, but can undergo rapid recall of memory responses to reinfection. These are all kinetic properties of adaptive immunity that we touched on in the diagram we discussed at the beginning of today's lecture. These responses are activated with a high degree of specificity, which is made possible by the expression of lymphocyte antigen receptors on the surface of adaptive lymphocytes. These receptors trigger a cellular activation state upon binding to cognate antigen, which is the term given to the unique antigen that fits into the binding region of an individual lymphocyte antigen receptor. Much like we saw with the pattern recognition receptors of innate immunity, lymphocyte antigen receptors must also maintain immune tolerance by recognizing only foreign antigens while remaining unresponsive to self-antigens. Lymphocytes are subjected to a variety of selection processes during development that eliminate self-reactive antigen receptors to prevent autoimmunity, which we'll discuss later on in lectures that cover lymphocyte development and maturation. Antigen receptors are quite interesting from a genetic and evolutionary perspective, as the gene loci for these receptors actually undergo genetic recombination, which means that the receptor repertoire of the adaptive immune system actually changes over the course of an individual's lifespan. The recombination events at these genes result in a massive amount of potential specificities for antigen receptors, which is important since this allows the adaptive immune system to essentially be poised and prepared to respond to an entire universe's worth of potential pathogen antigens that it just hasn't encountered yet. Another interesting consequence of this genetic rearrangement is that each individual lymphocyte has its own unique genome, and it's worth noting that lymphocytes are the only cell type that do this in the body. Lastly, while innate immune components are conserved amongst many different species, Adaptive immunity is only present in vertebrate lineages, so this gives a hint that it must be pretty important in terms of improving host fitness over evolutionary time since it's been selected for over the course of metazoan evolution. Lastly, let's summarize the primary functions of the adaptive immune system. Adaptive immunity is carried out by two types of lymphocytes, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. B lymphocytes are primarily responsible for secreting a type of soluble molecule called an antibody, which can execute a variety of protective functions that we'll discuss later, but B cells can also serve as APCs in certain contexts. T lymphocytes can either support B cell responses, this is a subset called helper T cells, or execute cytotoxic effector functions, and this is a subset called cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Both B and T cells share the same ultimate goals of both eliminating an infectious pathogen while limiting deleterious inflammation and off-target effects that could harm healthy tissue at the site of infection, in addition to forming long-lived memory lymphocyte populations that are maintained for the duration of an individual's lifetime. These pools of adaptive immune memory cells can then undergo reactivation upon re-exposure to that same pathogen, forming the basis of immunological memory responses. 
For the last section of this lecture, we'll introduce the cell types responsible for mediating adaptive immunity. If we revisit our differentiation figure, you'll remember that the common lymphoid progenitor here on the left gives rise to both B and T lymphocytes, which are the key cell types of the adaptive immune system. Although there aren't as many different types of adaptive immune cells, B and T cells can display a lot of heterogeneity depending on their activation status. Immunologists will address this heterogeneity by defining what we call subsets of B cells or T cells, which we'll discuss later on in lectures covering adaptive immunity. For now, I'll just introduce some general schematics of T and B cell function. T lymphocytes have a lymphocyte antigen receptor called the T cell receptor, or TCR. This receptor exists in a membrane-bound form at the surface of the T cell, which can only be activated upon binding to something called the peptide MHC complex, which is expressed on the surface of antigen-presenting cells, or APCs. MHC is simply a protein complex that holds a piece of an antigen in such a way that the TCR can bind to it and becomes activated um, by its cognate antigen. T cells come in two major types, helper T cells, which express a surface marker called CD4, and cytotoxic T cells, which express a C surface marker called CD8. For both CD4s and CD8s, activation of the TCR through binding to peptide MHC, in addition to co-stimulatory markers, typically leads to the proliferation of the T cell into many identical daughter cells, all of which express the same TCR specificity. And these cells can then go on to exert various effector functions depending on whether they are helper or cytotoxic T cells. At the same time, a portion of these cells will differentiate towards a memory lineage where they will form a stable pool of long-lived memory T cells. B lymphocytes also express a lymphocyte antigen receptor, which is creatively named the B cell receptor, or BCR. The BCR can exist in two forms, the membrane-bound form, which is referred to as the BCR, or a secreted form, and these are antibodies, which are soluble molecules that we've referred to a few times so far in this course. Unlike the TCR, which can only bind to cognate antigen when presented by APCs, the BCR can bind directly to soluble antigen and does not require antigen presentation. Similarly to T cells, once the BCR is engaged, B cells will rapidly proliferate into identical daughter cells that all express the same BCR specificity and execute effector functions, which is primarily fulfilled by antibody secretion, although we should also note that B cells can also present antigen to T cells, but this doesn't really require a burst of proliferation. Just like T cells, a portion of activated B cells will differentiate towards a memory lineage in order to generate long-term memory B cells. So remember that both B and T cells can form this highly specific type of immunological memory, which is a central hallmark of adaptive immunity. In summary, I want you to focus on the introductory fact that immune responses can be broadly separated into two parts, innate immunity and adaptive immunity. These two arms of an immune response differ with respect to their functionality, the timing of when they are engaged following exposure to an immunological insult, and their ability to form long-term immune memory. We've also learned more specific differences about the types of receptors used by each system to engage appropriate immune responses and how these differ between innate and adaptive immune cells in terms of their specificity and evolution. And all of these points are summarized in the bullet points uh, listed here. Just as a reminder, you have one more lecture to watch for this week. So lecture 1D will introduce us to the organs of the immune system, which we call lymphoid organs as well as the lymphatic system, which is used to move immune cells throughout the body in order to effectively patrol for signs of infection or injury.